This is K.M. Wyland, and you're listening to the 277th episode of the Helping Writers Become Authors podcast. I'm a workaholic, and I'm a lucky workaholic because I love my work. But my goal this year is to slow down a little bit and take some extra time on a routine basis to smell the roses and refill my inspiration tank. I'm planning to dedicate one full day a week just to fiction and take another day away from business stuff to focus on odds and ends like grocery shopping, uh, studying foreign languages just for fun, enjoying the outdoors, and just dream zoning. I'm not big on New Year's goals since I believe goals should be implemented whenever they become necessary, but I do love how the turn of the year always seems to inspire us to reevaluate our lives and make adjustments as necessary. So here's to a 2015 full of novel writing and dream zoning, as well as, you know, all that fun blogging, podcasting, and vlogging stuff. The latest post in the video series on my blog is, I just figured out what all my favorite stories have in common, and it blew my mind. It talks about the secret ingredient that can take even mediocre ideas and turn them into your reader's favorite five-star stories. To find the post, visit my site at helpingwritersbecomeauthors.com. And now, I hope you enjoyed this week's podcast entitled, Get Rid of On-The-Nose Dialogue Once and For All. Know what sets apart the okay writers from the great writers? Subtlety and subtext. This is true in absolutely every area of storytelling, from narrative to plotting to character development. But the lack of subtlety and subtext is perhaps nowhere more obvious than in dialogue. I'm talking, of course, about on-the-nose dialogue. When I pick up a potential read and skim through its opening paragraphs to discover whether or not the book will pique my interest, one of the first things I look at is the dialogue. If it's on the nose, I'm out of there. Why? Because if the author is giving me on-the-nose dialogue, then it's a sure bet he's not going to be able to give me the other subtleties of story and the rich subtext that I and so many other readers crave. In short, this is a big deal. If you've got on-the-nose dialogue in your story, you could be endangering your chances of getting read by everyone from agent to editor to Amazon shopper. On the flip side, however, we have the good news. If you can identify and slay on the news dialogue from the outset and learn how to replace it with rich undercurrents of subtext, then you're on your way to becoming a master author. So what is on the news dialogue? Simply put, on the news dialogue is dialogue that says exactly what it means, nothing more and nothing less. For example, you're a terrible boyfriend, Melissa sniffed. I shrugged. I know, and I'm sorry, but just think about the horrible example my father set me. He was gone all the time when I was a kid. That doesn't matter to me. I can't stand it anymore. I'm breaking up with you. My heart fractured. I understand where you're coming from, but I still love you. So why is that a bad thing? Because it's two-dimensional, because it's obvious, because it's boring, because it's unrealistic. You know all those Walmart conversations you've made a professional hobby out of eavesdropping on? Take another listen. In real life, human beings very rarely say exactly what they mean. And when they do, they rarely say all they mean. We play our cards close to our chests, perhaps because we don't completely trust whomever we're speaking with, perhaps because we have our own agenda and blunt honesty isn't the best way to achieve it, Perhaps because we're lying to ourselves about our own motivations. Our brains are complicated places. So are our relationships. Our real-life dialogue reflects that, and so should our characters. So, on-the-nose dialogue, bad. Got it. But where do you go from here? How do you create dialogue that isn't on-the-nose? In truth, there are as many ways to avoid on-the-nose dialogue as there are ways to write beautiful dialogue. And that's a lot. But let's focus on three of the most important. Method number one, make the conversation about what isn't said. 
If the problem with On the Nose dialogue is that it's about nothing more than what's being said on the surface of the conversation, then the obvious first step is to start digging around under that surface. Consider this early exchange between Emperor Marcus Aurelius and his daughter Lucilla in Ridley Scott's Gladiator. Marcus, if only you had been born a man, what a Caesar you would have made. Lucilla, father. Marcus, you would have been strong. I wonder, would you have been just? Lucilla, I would have been what you taught me to be. Marcus, oh, how was your journey? Lucilla, long, uncomfortable. Why have I come? Marcus, I need your help with your brother. Lucilla, of course. Marcus, he loves you, he always has, and he will need you now, more than ever. But enough of politics. Let us pretend that you are a loving daughter and I a good father. Lucilla, this is a pleasant fiction, isn't it? This is the first conversation between these two characters, and it takes place early on in the first act, when the story still has much to establish about the characters and where they stand within the normal world. From just this tiny conversation, we learn of the rocky but still affectionate relationship between Lucilla and her father. We learn that Marcus's parenting skills were questionable. We learn Marcus would prefer Lucilla to have been his heir rather than his son Commodus. And we hear a hint of the obsessively strong relationship between Lucilla and her brother. But none of this is ever stated outright. The characters dance around these truths because their truths are both personally painful and politically dangerous. They understand what's really being said, as does the audience, but the result is much more realistic and pleasing than if it had all been spelled out. Reportedly, Ridley Scott disliked the original script because the dialogue was too on the nose and ordered it reworked. The result is masterful, not just in this scene, but throughout. Method number two, employ irony. Sometimes story circumstances just plain demand you spell things out. Sometimes this works well simply because of the contrast with the preceding subtext-rich scenes, but sometimes you'll still need to finesse the circumstances of the dialogue to keep it from being too obvious. A bravura example comes at the end of Band of Brothers with the monologue that sums up the entire theme. Men, it's been a long war. It's been a tough war. You fought bravely proudly for your country. You're a special group. You've found in one another a bond that exists only in combat, among brothers. You've shared foxholes, held each other in dire moments. You've seen death and suffered together. I'm proud to have served with each and every one of you. You all deserve long and happy lives in peace. That's about as on the nose as it gets, but it totally works. Why? Because the person delivering the speech is a captured German general who asked leave to speak to his men one last time. His words are translated quietly, respectfully, by the American translator. If we put aside the understatement allowed by the translation, we can see it's the irony of the situation that allows this pointed speech to be so powerful and touching. This is the enemy talking. This is a defeated enemy talking. And yet his words move not just his own imprisoned men, but every one of his victorious captors as well, because the irony of war is that the words are perfectly true of both sides. Method number three, when in doubt, shut your characters up. Never miss a good opportunity to shut up. That's just as true for our characters as it is for us. If discretion is the better part of valor, then silence is often the better part of discretion. Some of the most powerful revelations in life are the wordless ones. Sometimes because they're so obvious they don't require words, and sometimes because they're too profound to put into words. In an interview with the writer in the November 2014 issue, Vina Sud, author of The Killing, noted, Most truth exists in the space between words. And most of our lives, if you observe carefully a day in the life of a home you are a visitor in, is lived in silence. Show, don't tell is one of the most important aphorisms of the writing life. The basic problem with on-the-nose dialogue is that it tells readers 
what characters are thinking and how readers should perceive those characters. Don't let yourself fall into that trap. Instead, use the awkward silences. Show readers what's going on inside your characters through their action, their narration, and the complexity of their non-talking moments, which can be deliciously misinterpreted by other characters. On the nose dialogue is more than a trap. It's a cage. Once we learn how to identify its bars and break out of the rigid confines of its strict factuality, a whole new world of opportunities opens up for us. So look beneath the surface of your story and embrace the endless depths of subtext in your character's dialogue. The result? A story that will assure readers right from its opening pages that they're in the hands of an author who knows what he's doing. Thank you for listening to the Wordplay Podcast. To read a transcript of this episode, you can visit my website at helpingwritersbecomeauthors.com. And be sure to check back again next week.